Now, we have a lot of brain cells in our beautiful brain, mm -hmm. but every minute that we do not perfuse that area of the brain, 1.9 million brain cells die. Wow. <laughs> So that is very significant. Yeah. So that really, to me, when I hear that, I really want to bring home the fact that we want to call 911 really quickly. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Aging in Style, the podcast dedicated to celebrating aging and what it takes to do it well. I'm Lori Williams. I'm a certified senior advisor and senior housing expert. In each episode, you'll learn stories of older adults who are thriving in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and in some cases, in their hundreds. Whether you're an older adult or the child of an older adult, this podcast is filled with insightful resources, organizations that are doing incredible work, and stories that will inspire you to volunteer, learn, and who knows, maybe even skydive in your golden years. Hi, welcome to Aging in Style. I'm so glad you have tuned in, and I think this is going to be one of the most informative podcasts that we've done. And I encourage you to listen all the way through and share it with your friends and family because you might just save a life. We are talking about strokes. And if you are a regular listener of the podcast, you know that my husband, Mark, had a series of devastating strokes on Christmas Day 2022. He had four strokes and we have been traveling this journey, a uh, roller coaster journey, I may add, of stroke recovery since then. So almost a year and a half. And I thought I knew about strokes until it affected my family and I didn't know much at all. And I have learned so much and I'm glad to know it now, but I feel that it's something we need to share with everyone. Everyone out there, y'all need to know what a stroke is, what the symptoms are, what the causes are, how you can prevent it. And that's the most important because there are so many ways you can prevent having a stroke. So to that end, I have invited on two guests who are experts in the field. They are both employed at Medical City Louisville, which is a fantastic hospital. And I speak from experience. My husband um, has been to many hospitals and many rehabs on this journey, but he had a stay at Medical City Louisville in their hospital and then also in their rehab. And they are fantastic. I just sing their praises all of the time. So I thought who better to have come on and talk about strokes, but um, representatives from Medical City Louisville. So today we have Miranda Bick-Williams. She's a registered nurse and certified case manager, and she has worked at Medical City Louisville for seven years. And in January 2023, she became the stroke coordinator for them. So she is a wealth of knowledge. Miranda is passionate about educating the public about stroke prevention, and she loves participating in community events that promote both the awareness of and the prevention of stroke. And then our second guest is Holly Thornhill, and she is also a registered nurse, and she is the Director of Quality Resources at Medical City Louisville. She has been a nurse for 19 years and has worked at Medical City Louisville for 14. She has a master's degree in healthcare administration. Holly lost her mother due to chronic illness complications, and she saw the effects that stroke can have both to her grandfather and to her grandmother, who had to become a full-time caregiver. So seeing that made her a champion for preventative medicine to decrease her own risk of developing chronic illness and stroke as she ages. So both of these ladies, I'm thrilled to have them as guests on the show. And I know you are going to learn so much about stroke. And hopefully you will take this information and share it with your friends and family as well. So welcome to the show, Miranda and Holly. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Well, I'm excited. Us. Excited y'all are here. So let's just get right into it and let's start talking about signs of stroke. What are the signs to be aware of? A lot of the public uses FAST and that's what American Heart still recommends. It's short and easy to remember. 
However, here in the local area, we use B fast, so we actually added a B and an E for that. And the B stands for balance. So B, any sudden loss in balance or equilibrium loss um, is very important to kind of think that, hey, that might be a stroke symptoms. The E stands for eyes, so any vision loss, blurred vision, double vision, or complete vision loss, you want to think about this might be a possible stroke symptom. F stands for face, so any facial weakness, um, any facial paralysis, so where it's numb, where you just mm-hmm. don't feel right in your face, it could also indicate a stroke. A stands for arms, and I always tend say for arms, if you hold up your arms or you can't even pick up your arm, or it drifts away, or it's heavy, and that also counts for the legs. So arms and legs are kind of in the same area. And then S stands for speech. Now, a lot of people know about the slurred speech, but what they do not know about is what we call aphasia. And so this is where you can't say a word, Mm -hmm. um, and you're trying to think of a word, or the word doesn't come out correctly. The other thing, what sometimes happens, is we put the wrong word into a place that it doesn't belong. So if you have a family member or yourself and you're saying, God, what a beautiful dog in the sky. Well, I wanted to say cloud, but I said Mm -hmm. dog. And so that is the wrong word in the wrong place. And then uh, T, of course, tends for time. Please call 911 when you have any of these stroke symptoms because we want to get you quickly to the hospital. Exactly. And, you know, with my husband, it was speech was what I noticed. He went to say the blessing and he couldn't get words out. And he does have severe aphasia and apraxia also. So that was a very clear indicator. Everything else, you know, was fine in the moment. He was walking and, and everything, but definitely... I knew that sign. So it's so important to remember fast or be fast. Absolutely. Yes. So what what causes a stroke to happen? Um, well, there is a lot of different causes for a stroke. Um, there's a lot of different risk factors. And mm-hmm. some we can help and some we cannot help. So one of the things as women, we are actually at higher risk for a stroke than men and so a lot of people in the public don't know this and that's a thing that we cannot change Mm -hmm. you know i'm a woman i'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) but i was born that way there's nothing that we can do but there's other things that we can do and one of the things when we look at that list high blood pressure is really on the top of that list high blood pressure control anybody that smokers is a higher Mm -hmm. risk for stroke because the nicotine in the cigarette constricts the blood vessels. And so if you're already having a little bit of an issue there, then, you know, you might have some stroke symptoms. Diabetes. uh, Diabetes is one of those diseases that can cause a lot of issues, a lot of problems, and especially when it comes to uh, the risk for stroke. Any high fat, high cholesterol diet, you know, um, the American Heart Association, as a matter of fact, recommends, you know, a Mediterranean kind of diet for people that have stroke. Physical inactivity. We drive our cars everywhere in America. Mm -hmm. And I even drive to Kroger now and sit in the parking lot and they deliver my groceries to me, (laughs) you know. So, yes, I am very physically inactive. I'm guilty of that. But physical inactivity Mm -hmm. places you at risk for strokes. And then, of course, because of we're inactive, we gain a couple extra pounds, you know. So our our weight is a big um, impact. Now... You always want to talk to your doctor about what are your levels, you know, what is your cholesterol level, Um, because cholesterol is a big major impact for stroke. And then we have the heart diseases. So anybody that has underlying AFib or underlying other conditions that can cause stroke, Um, And then one that Holly always talks about is the sleep apnea Mm -hmm. and the stroke, Mm -hmm. you know, we if you have sleep apnea, you're at higher risk for stroke and we want to be aware of that. 
And then there's some diseases that are more culturally related, such as sickle cell disease. So a lot of our African-American populations are at risk for stroke if they have sickle cell disease, because those, those sickling cells, what are not perfectly round and mm -hmm. bouncy, they can connect to each other and cause a clot. And so um, then you're at risk for stroke. And then, of course, you have carotid artery disease and peripheral artery diseases. Mm -hmm. So all of those are at high risk for strokes. Okay. Any, any one of those conditions can cause the two types of stroke that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, the most common one is the one like Miranda just uh, touched on a little bit, which is the when things uh, form a clot. Mm -hmm. And it, things can be a sickle cell, it can be blood, it can be cholesterol, it can be plaque. I mean, things that are inside your vessel, they'll form a clot and, it, and it'll move to a spot that it can't move anymore. Your teeny tiny vessels in your brain and it causes a blockage mm -hmm. where oxygen can't get where it needs to. The other type is where the vessel itself allows blood to go out so it will um, get to the small space and bust and it's that blood going out mm -hmm. that causes the damage and that's the the bleeding we call it hemorrhagic mm -hmm. but it's a bleeding stroke versus a clotting stroke okay so any one of those conditions can predispose you to those types of stroke mm -hmm. uh, on one level or another and the clotting one is the ischemic is that yes, that's okay ischemic yeah. okay and then what i didn't realize is so because i guess you don't really think about it but when you have a stroke when it happens it that part of the brain where it strikes that dies basically mm -hmm. so yeah so basically a stroke means blood flow occlusion or interruption and both types of strokes have that hemorrhagic mm -hmm. and ischemic because it interrupts the blood flow to the tissue beyond that stroke. And unless that is restored really quickly, then that tissue actually has damage and can die mm -hmm. off. Uh, and it doesn't work anymore. Now, yeah. what the recovery is associated with that is a whole different story. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so remember as a stroke is blood flow obstruction or occlusion mm -hmm. um, to the tissue beyond mm -hmm. the stroke itself. Yeah, one mm -hmm. of the images that it works best uh, for me, and so a lot of times that translates for people uh, as well, is if you think of uh, your, your vessels like a garden hose, your brain is the garden. And so if there was a point at which you're watering your garden, but you suddenly just like kink your hose, all the flowers in that section are not going to do so great. You're mm -hmm. not going to get all the water you need. You might get a couple of dribbles. You might get none at all based on the level of kinking that you do on the hose. And so it's either the correction of that kink that helps with the those flowers or either fixing the problem of the water coming from somewhere else in the mm -hmm. hose that's going to allow the water to go right to where it needs to in that garden. Um, but it's everything past that point um, of where the, the kinking or the, the dribbling's coming out of. Mm -hmm. Now, we have a lot of brain cells in, in, our, in our beautiful brain, and I love the brain, just FYI. It's one. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's I do interesting. what I do. Mm -hmm. But every minute that we do not perfuse that area of the brain, 1.9 million brain cells die. Wow. <laughs> so that is very significant yeah. so that really to me when i hear that i really want to bring home the fact that we want to call 911 really quickly mm -hmm. so when someone has a has symptoms they call 911 kind of what's what happens next so our ems liaisons here especially in this area are fantastic mm -hmm. they really work well together with us and so they give the hospital a pre-notification of that they potentially are bringing in the stroke patient mm -hmm. so our stroke team gets together our er physician our er nurses uh, yeah. phlebotomy respiratory radiology, radiology mm -hmm. you know if i'm in the facility i happen to go there mm -hmm. as well so we all get together and so the patient is met at the hospital but on their way to the hospital, our EMS providers are already giving treatment. I'm going to mm -hmm. give it to Holly here and talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Yes. On the, on the, you know, oftentimes I've had people tell me, I live two minutes away from the hospital. It's easier for me to just get someone to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But if you think of it in terms of by the time they're getting to your house, they're already giving stroke care. They're already giving cardiac care. Mm -hmm. They're giving whatever care they need because 
uh, in order to get, sometimes you can get medications that will uh, resolve the, you know, kinking in your water hose and they get the clot busting medication, but we have to get you ready for that medicine. So if your blood pressure is too high, they can already give you that medicine. They can already do some tests on the way, even if it's only a few minutes to determine is your symptoms that you're having related to something going on with your heart or is it something going on with your brain? Your brain's giving you the symptoms because you're not getting enough blood, but that could be for other reasons besides a stroke. So they're already doing those things so that by the time you're in the coming in the front door, you've potentially already gotten blood pressure medication, you've already begin, been evaluated for a heart attack, you've already gotten all that additional care so that when you come in the door, you're already ready to get the um, medication that you could be eligible for to help resolve the um, stroke symptoms and or the stroke completely. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it's not a stroke, they've already done the other prep work for additional things you might need if it is cardiac related or some other type of condition, they've already done that on the way and you wouldn't have got that in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, because car's fast and you know mm-hmm. it's hard to wait. Minutes seem horrible when you're in yeah. that scenario. But, it, but getting the extra minutes back that you get in that ride is priceless. And I mean, I 100% agree because my mind when Mark had his stroke was just the fast. I've got to get him there fast. And so I went to the hospital closest. Had I called 911, I mean, you know, when something like that happens, you do panic a little bit. But this is why I think it's important to talk about it and like know this, have this knowledge in advance. We didn't go to the right hospital. So they still had to, I mean, had I called 911, they would have taken him to the hospital, which was a little further, not much, but instead I took him to the wrong hospital and he ended up being care flighted. So I, you know, who knows how much time that cost us or, or what, but you know, it is what it is, but just learn from my mistake. Yes. You want to be fast, but call 911. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's what the, the, the T stands for in mm-hmm. fast. It's not go to the hospital. It's yeah. dial 911. Yes. Right. And the other thing, what happens when our EMS providers pick you up, then you come to the hospital. And one of the first things we do is we scan your brain. We do what we call a CT scan. And if applicable, we do further testing such as a CTA scan and an MRI scan. But When you get first to the hospital, you get a CT scan. A lot of people are coming to you. A lot of questions are being asked. One of the biggest questions that we're going to ask is, when was your last known normal? And that is something important to know. If you cannot answer, and your family member can answer this for you, they can answer what's your last known normal. And the reason that's important is because that clot busting medication that Miss Holly was talking mm-hmm. about can only be given in a certain time period. Mm-hmm. And so it's very important for us to realize when that time period is. The other question you're going to have is, do you take any medication that causes anticoagulation? So are you on a Plavix? Are you on aspirin? Are you on warfarin or mm-hmm. an exaban or anything like that? We want to know that information. Mm-hmm. And then what are your symptoms? So basically, your last known normal is what they're going to ask. They're going to ask you about blood thinning medication and they're going to know, ask you about your symptoms. Mm-hmm. What are you feeling? What is going on? And everything happens really quickly. Um, a lot of people say, I can't believe, you know, they started an IV and they did the CT and they were asking questions and I was getting stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> but this is because time is of the essence. Yeah. 1.9 million brain cells are dying every minute. Mm. So we want to save as many of those brain cells as possible. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. And, you know, you mentioned the clot busting drug. And of course, the reason why they're asking if you're on Plavix or anything like that is because, and they warned me, once we give it to him, he will start bleeding. And he was bleeding from cuts that he had. And it was like scary. I, I think, and, and I think probably other people have this thought, like, you know, about if you know about the clot busting drug, you feel like, and this is how I was, he is going to get that and he's going to be fine because we got here fast. But that's not always the case because of the type of clot. material in the clot. Yes. yes. So the clot busting medication is a clot busting medication for blood, not for other foreign materials. And we can have other foreign materials in our body. Um, we can have cholesterol occlusions. We can have small little bone fragments if we also have a trauma going on mm-hmm. at the same time. 
So there's other things that are in our blood. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes it doesn't help. But the thing is, it is the best possible medication mm -hmm. with the potential benefit. And the physician, and, and this is something that is so important to realize, the physician really takes everything into account. Is this potential beneficial to the patient? Otherwise, we wouldn't even have the conversation. Yeah. We were talking earlier before we started recording about TIAs. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk a little more about what that is and why it's, like you said, that's a big warning light coming on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, TIAs, um, you will hear some people, um, the verbiage is still out there. They'll call them a mini stroke. I, my, my favorite thing to imagery wise, because I'm a visual person, so imagery works best for me is they'll say, well, I just had a mini one. So it's not as exciting as like a regular stroke. <laughs> and I jokingly say it, but it is in all seriousness. I say it's not mini, it's snack sized mm -hmm. in that it's still the thing. It's yeah. still, it's still in that same family and it's a warning light to you. It's your yellow light, even having some of those symptoms, even if they evaluated you for a TIA and they said you didn't have one, it's the same. Um, mm -hmm. So you're going to want to look at those things that may have contributed to your potential for stroke. And those are the things you can control. Like Miranda talked about, um, we call them modifiable, but they're the, I don't want to use usually, it's the, the exercise, uh, the exercise and, <laughs> and the diet and the, the nut salt and the cholesterol stuff. Um, it's not, it's not as glamorous as just taking a medicine and making everything go away, mm -hmm. but it's, it's your body trying to tell you a message in the only way it knows how. And it is a yellow light towards potentially a more serious condition, which is the, you know, uh, two types of stroke that are causing damage. Um, so it's as serious. We treat it just mm -hmm. as seriously. And we hope that um, the message is clear when patients get to the hospital level and they're treated for that so that they understand that, yes, we're giving you all the information for stroke because that's the place that you're at. Um, mm -hmm. And to look at the things, can I control my blood pressure better? Can I get my blood sugar in better control? I may not be able to stop medicine, but that may not be the goal. Maybe the goal just have yeah. better control. Yeah, or stop medicine. smoking. Stop or, smoking mm -hmm. or, you know, um, not not have as much, um, you know, energy drinks or caffeine or mm -hmm. um, stress, yeah. you know, in your life. Mm -hmm. Or how do you manage your stress in your life? Um, to really just take that pause and evaluate the things that you can control and determine, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, address this because I know where I ultimately could be headed because of TIA. Yeah. You just mentioned energy drinks. Do mm -hmm. they cause strokes? Well, not directly. Okay. You're not going to drink one rock star and have yeah. a stroke. But energy drinks have caffeine. Mm -hmm. They have an increased amount of caffeine. Yeah. Sometimes they have other additives in them. Don't even, can't even keep track of all yeah. the things that are in energy drinks. But, um, you know, some people will, will say, well, I'm not drinking coffee. So at least I'm mm -hmm. not drinking coffee. Or the energy drink people are really great about, you know, advertising in such a way um, to make it appear it does have some fruit juice or something in it. <laughs> might make it seem healthier. Yeah. Um, or if they do work out, I'm working out, so i got to get my mm -hmm. pre-workout. But be mindful of the ingredients. If it has extra caffeine, we're speaking the same language when we're saying decrease your caffeine intake. Mm -hmm. It's the same. We're yeah. st it's still decrease your caffeine intake. Mm -hmm. Even some headache medicines have extra ca have extra caffeine in yeah. it. So it's more just to be mindful. It's not always coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, I go straight to thinking caffeine is coffee, but mm -hmm. it's sodas. It's it's yeah. in a lot of things. So, um, but yes, energy drinks do have uh, many of them, and one serving has as much as a cup of coffee. So if you, mm. your larger ones will have several cups of coffee in wow. them. And they're not the, the healthiest things yeah. in the world to be drinking. I don't, I don't drink them, but, uh, you know, my daughter's a college student, and I've seen yeah. her drinking them, so we'll have a little conversation. Yeah, no, it's, it's the amount. It's everything yeah. in, in, in moderation. In moderation, yeah. be mindful. And um, <coughs> it's one of those you can do if you know you're you're drinking a lot of them, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that level is, yeah. then don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, try exactly. to decrease it. Any amounts is going to be better than no amount. Mm -hmm. So if you can't get rid of them completely can't get rid of your coffee completely, uh, then just decrease. Yeah. You know, that's anything mm -hmm. that's going to help. Yeah. And as you said, people, when we talked earlier, like you'll have older patients come in, have a TIA, and they don't, they go home and they don't change anything because no. they don't take that warning, which right. they need to. The, sometimes the message that gets heard or interpreted is, well, at least I didn't have a stroke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was really close. I had a mini yeah. stroke, if best, but I'll have a lot of patients tell us, that, well, at least I didn't have a stroke. I only had a TIA and not make that connection that 
that yeah you got right to the yellow light yeah um that's your warning that's your warning mm-hmm. you you got some messages that, that the body's trying to tell you mm-hmm. so if these changes are not made tia is really keying yourself up for having a stroke yeah and also people that have strokes are at higher risk for repeat strokes mm-hmm. and that's very important i wanted to touch on one more thing because we touched on the clot busting medication but the other thing is, well, what if the clot is something else? But mm-hmm. what, what is, what else can we do? Well, within 24 hours, so with 24 hours of onset, so we call it an acute stroke, is we can do intervention. And there's actually uh, a wonderful faci- facility here in our area. Our mm-hmm. sister facility, and they actually go in and they remove those clots. Mm-hmm. And so. That clot busting medication is has to be done in a certain time frame, like within four and a half hours, but we can intervene within 24 hours mm-hmm. still. And so there's other options, other treatment options. And so that's another reason why it's so important to get to the hospital so we can key you up for all of those mm-hmm. things. Um, that does make us uniquely different in our area versus mm-hmm. uh, other parts of the country yeah. uh, um, is because we have a lot of sister facilities 13 plus uh, Mm -hmm. sister facilities many have different capabilities for stroke but we're all interconnected in that Mm -hmm. way to where by the time someone's coming into even just our facility we're already evaluating are they going to be a candidate for this other type of treatment do they need to go to one of the sister facilities so that the transport to facilities and care along the way and before they go to the facility Mm -hmm. is already queuing them up for the other side of things and the um, transition is seamless or can appear seamless it's very thoughtful in getting someone the care for both sides even if Mm -hmm. we can't do the one the one type of procedure um, that Miranda's talking about it's called a thrombectomy um, procedure We've already queued you up to go to our, one of our sister facilities that is thrombectomy capable, and mm-hmm. we're already like we're managing you to get you to that that next level of care. And also, if if your stroke is in the thirteen percent, so it's not a clot, but it's a bleed, mm-hmm. and that's a very scary side situation because how do you stop a bleed in the brain? Well, we also have special procedures mm-hmm. for that, and again, we will give the patient the best possible opportunity to recover from Mm -hmm. these kind of strokes so again calling 911 is really really key when Mm -hmm. you have any of the be fast or fast Mm -hmm. symptoms Mm -hmm. yeah and you know it happened a few years ago but there's especially within our facility system we look at patients holistically it is not simply that you have like gross deficits uh, and gross is in like major deficits Mm -hmm. um, where I can't move a body part and that's how my new normal and how I have to live. We get to the level, we even have posters in the ED, it's, we call it debilitating symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if you, if your love of life is knitting teeny tiny sweaters for kittens and this (laughs) is going to impact your love of your life of, of knitting teeny tiny sweaters for kittens, that is taken into account because mm-hmm. you need that fine dexterity yeah. to do that. Or if your other, you know, whatever it is, while your deficit may not be very big, we still are evaluating that because it may not be big on an anatomical body, you know, level, but it is to you. Mm-hmm. You know, I read stories to, you know, children, and now I can't speak so well. Mm-hmm. And that that's my volunteer work. That's what I do. And so... I can't do that now. So that's really going to impact me as a person. So those kinds of things are taken into account, even if, you know, they can move their arms and legs. Yeah. And, it, you know, just from my experience, I know everyone's different and yep. how they are affected by the stroke. Unfortunately, my husband had some, you know, major, he was affected in a major way. But, you know, they did start as soon as he was out of ICU. And this is probably the protocol. Mm-hmm. You start therapy okay. right away. And it's, you know, PT, OT, speech, everything. Mm-hmm. So when they start all the therapy, the reason is it's going to create new pathways. So explain how that works. So the brain uh, is a wonderful organ. Like I said, I'm Mm -hmm. super excited about the brain all the time. (laughs) (laughs) And so what the brain does is it's realizing that, hey, I don't have enough blood flow to this area. And it's creating sometimes these what we call collateral pathways Mm -hmm. to reperfuse the area. But also 
in the cases of when you have speech abnormality, what's in our Broca area, it's a specific area of the brain, where the brain then try to new, make new neural pathways, mm-hmm. is try to make new bridges mm-hmm. to reach the other side so we can have some recovery. Mm-hmm. And with stroke, the first month after the stroke, you make the most recovery. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot. But up until two years after a stroke you can still make recovery mm-hmm. processes and that's why even when you leave the hospital a lot of our patients will continue to see speech and ot and pt mm-hmm. and work very close with their primary care and the neurologist to really get the most gains back mm-hmm. of what they lost and that's key yeah. And I know, you know, for my husband, I'm thankful that we're in the Dallas area because he has been in some fabulous places. And he's actually been to your rehab <laughs> as well, which I've said this before, but that was his favorite. And I don't think he wanted to leave because he Not was many yeah, he was treated like a king. And he ended up there Absolutely. because as something that can happen with strokes in January, he had a seizure which we didn't know we, he was sick. So we thought, you know, that was the reason why. But then he had another seizure a few weeks ago. So now he's on medication for seizures. But in what percentage of cases does that happen? Is there a percentage? So I do not know mm-hmm. the exact percentage of seizures in stroke patients. Mm-hmm. However, it is one of the things that we hear that patients that have had strokes have seizures mm-hmm. uh, more often than patients that did not have a stroke. Yeah. So a higher population of our stroke population can have seizures mm-hmm. than patients that never had a stroke. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and it's because of the damage of the brain. It's the wiring in the brain mm-hmm. that is just, just misfiring and we're missing pieces. And so that's why the seizures are there. Um, we are aware of this and we monitor for this in the hospital and then in your case mm-hmm. in your husband's case the seizures came later mm-hmm. and that you'll see a lot so you see it a lot with people that have brain damage uh, even people in car accidents yeah. might start getting seizures mm-hmm. uh, people that have epileptic uh, you know they they can have some brain damage going on as well so the seizures are there it, mm-hmm. it's all about the brain yeah um so yeah some people do indeed have seizures the percentage i am not 100 mm-hmm. percent sure about okay mm-hmm. and we we are uniquely i'm glad you mentioned our rehab because we're Joint Commission certified for both. So for you know, Miranda and myself, we're heavily involved on both sides of that process. But it uniquely, again, thinking of someone in their continuum of care, it cues them up to not only they're getting the best um, management when they first come in the hospital, mm-hmm. but then once they're they're past those you know first days or so and they're kind of starting to stabilize um, medically, we're very passionate about getting them the uh, rehabilitative needs and because it's an inpatient rehab Mm -hmm. they have requirements where they have to you know be pretty pretty uh, stringent and Mm -hmm. very like aggressive in a good way to get someone really back to as close to baseline or as best they can possibly be Um, their goal is to send people home we're not trying to you know get someone Mm rehab and then go to a nursing home it's really it's their absolute goal is to get someone even better than they first started lots of times people are doing more activity than they did before they came to the hospital and uh, they have very highly motivated and exciting passionate people for that process Mm -hmm. so they make the patient feel like that that they're king and i did i witness that every day (laughs) with how they do that but it gets them passionate about their own care Mm -hmm. it gets them passionate about taking care of their health and getting them um, excited about their own health and what what that can look like mm-hmm. um, by fostering those types of um, ways. Um, so it is nice because then seamlessly yeah. someone can discharge from the inpatient side and then just you know an elevator right away go to the rehab side. So even when family are coming, because um, that's always a part of the process. If if someone has family or friends um, to help encourage that, gosh, that's so many months after surgery because we're there to encourage that physical therapy encourage that movement because we know the effects that it'll have on someone's brain long term Mm -hmm. and their body long term so 
Uh, absolutely, we love it. Yeah. That they're able to- it was amazing, and he was very motivated there. And I like that it's, it's smaller because we've been in a great, like it's a great place. So we went all over Dallas. <laughs> but I will say, I mean, I tell everyone, it was my favorite. And he loved the ginger ale in mm-hmm. the little kitchen. He could go get those yep. little tiny ginger ales. I don't know why that made him happy, <laughs> but he did come back and was able to like come home on the weekend and then Monday back to his normal rehab at the um, Center for Neuro Skills where he goes. So, you know, y'all did a great job. So <laughs> I share that with everyone. Um, so we kind of talked about treatments and the types of strokes and, and what causes strokes. And one other thing that I know is a hot topic to bring up, but I have had many people say to me or ask me you know did mark have the covid vaccine and yes he did and you know some of the reactions people have it's it's like you know shaming him like he caused this he brought this on himself and i don't believe that having the covid vaccine causes strokes so we talked a little bit about this before we start recording and i want to address that so tell us wendy there's not a direct (laughs) link between the vaccine and having a stroke. However, COVID did have a direct link to some strokes. And so people um, that got COVID uh, go in a different cascade, the blood does different things, and that might bring you at higher risk from stro- to stroke. But the vaccine itself, there has not been any scientific relationship between the vaccine and stroke itself. Mm-hmm. None that, that I'm aware of personally, or you know, when we've done research, it, it strictly it's the having had COVID, uh, especially having the earlier versions of COVID seem mm-hmm. to have the most damaging effects on people's hearts and um, thus uh, also their brains as well, um, just because it's effect on the body. And the, the more recent strains that are out there, because it's a virus, it, it grows and, mm-hmm. and uh, just like any other virus. So the different versions that are out there now don't appear to have the same types of effects that the earlier versions did. The other versions did, were, were just causing a lot of havoc just on your body in general. So um, that's the only known research um, that I'm aware of that has had an effect, not the vaccine mm-hmm. itself. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of bring it to a close and just kind of reiterate the top risk factors the things that you can control are (laughs) so the big ones are hypertension diabetes smoking inactivity diet and your numbers they're giant Mm -hmm. so go to your doctor ask what is my lousy or ldl (laughs) i always call it the lousy cholesterol what is my lousy cholesterol number or my ldl number Mm -hmm. where do i need it to be if i'm a diabetic where do you want my a1c to be what can i do to improve my blood sugar daily where do you want that to be what is my blood pressure number where do you want my blood pressure to be do i need to monitor this at home Um, You know, what kind of diet should I be on? You know, is there a particular diet that would be better for me? Because it's individual, Mm -hmm. because we're all individuals and our body does different things. And we cannot say blanketly for everybody, oh, yeah, just everybody go on this diet. So Mm -hmm. talk to your provider. But the big thing, the absolute big thing, 85% of ischemic strokes are caused by hypertension. Mm-hmm. Please get those numbers on the control. Yeah, know your numbers. I think that's so important. Yeah, and if you want to get a sticker, you know, A1, A plus sticker from your doctor, ask them that directly. Mm-hmm. Say, I would like to prevent a stroke. Yeah. How can I do that mm-hmm. based on what's going on with me right now? Yeah. You know, I, I heard you say what my, my blood pressure was. How does that affect my risk for stroke? Or how does that blood sugar um, number affect my risk for stroke? They love that question. Mm -hmm. They'll happily answer it all day long. Um, And they'll be impressed that you ask them that Mm -hmm. in that way, knowing that you care enough about what's going on with your health to try to prevent it um, for things that that potentially you and your doctor can work together on to help get you where you need to be. Mm -hmm. The good thing is about anything that you do for your body for preventing stroke. So... What you do for your body to prevent stroke also helps your heart. So really, you're getting a twofer. 
Mm-hmm. That's what a good point. What you do for your heart, you're also doing to prevent stroke. Because that's why the American Heart Association is one of the organizations that help with the stroke. Because it's the same vessel system that we're mm-hmm. talking about. So what's good for your heart is good for your brain. What's good for your brain is good for your heart. Good to know. Well, thank you both for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge. And, you know, for me to get the message out is, you know, I don't want anyone to go through what my family has been through. And I know strokes, um, you know, the risk of them are pretty high and there can be some not so great outcomes with them. And so I think it's important to have this knowledge. So thank you so much for for being on. Thank you for having us. All right. Thanks for listening to the podcast. And if you want more information, you can visit the website, which is lauriewilliams-seniorservices.com. And any questions you have, please send an email to us or you can send through the website. And please, please, please share this very important episode with your friends and family. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you next week.